So I just want to orient you. Here's how the security training works at City College. This is the start of the security program, like it would be anywhere. That's the point of Security Plus. After you already know basically how computers and networks work, because you hopefully have A plus and Net plus, then you do Security Plus, and then you're going to learn the basic terms and concepts of security. And pretty much everybody in IT needs to know this much. If you want to go into penetration testing and attack at a more advanced level, we have hacking classes that teach you how to attack machines and defend them more specifically than these attacks. Um, and those have a lot of information from modern things that may be beyond textbooks. Um, and you can get the Certified Ethical Hacker Certificate. I have to warn you, my class is not very closely tied to that certificate. So it is not as, like this class is very closely tied to the Security Plus. We're using an official Security Plus book that practice test questions are just like the ones on a real exam. We're really preparing for the exam. These hacking classes do not tie that closely to the Certified Ethical Hacker Certificate at all because I didn't think it was worth it. But um, CISSP is definitely worth it. And that class is, again, like this one, tied directly to the certificate. You have, you're preparing to take that one test because it's a very valuable test. The Certified Ethical Hacker Certificate is not as widely respected. Um, and we have Computer Forensics Class 2 and a Firewalls Class. These are all things you can take here. And a couple of new ones coming up next semester, hopefully. Uh, malware Forensics and um, <coughs> DNS Security, but those have not yet been approved. Anyway, so let's get started in this glorious textbook here. So um, here's the basic essence of security. Security is a kind of vague concept like health or beauty or honesty or loyalty. These are things you want, but you don't know, there's no such thing as having a perfect security or even a clear measure. Do you have security? Oh, now you don't have security because security needs a 10 and you have a 9. There's a huge effort in the industry to try to make security metrics because right now it's kind of awful. Your company gets hacked, so you hire some guy that's famous to fix your network, and then you might get hacked again next year. So then you say, what happened? And he, they would like to say, well, your security was 10, but because you hired me, now it's 20, and that's better. And they'd like to say, that means you lose $1 million less per year. People are trying to do that. So far, we're nowhere near that. It's all just vague and uh, based on experience and estimates and stuff. So nobody can say, how much money do you really save your company by buying this specific security product? It's really hard to get down to a number like that. Anyway, but here's what security is. These three things you want. You want confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You want all three of them, and then draw them like a triangle because you can never have all three. Confidentiality means that only authorized people are accessing information. Availability means when authorized people try to do what they're supposed to do, the system is there working for them. And integrity means that nobody is altering data except people who are authorized to do that. You can never have all three of these things at the perfect level. That's why one con statement people make in beginning security classes is they say the most secure computer is turned off and locked in a safe. And that, that computer is not letting any bad people in, and it's not letting any bad people change data, but it's not available for the good people, so that is not security. It's not security, it's the undergoing denial of service attack. Security means you let the right people do their jobs, but you don't let the bad people in. And of course, that's impossible. As you know, as soon as you let in, any of the right people, you let in the sneakiest bad people who are good at sneaking in. As soon as you exclude any of the bad people, you've excluded some of the good people who get bounce off easily, like the people who keep forgetting their password or something. You can't have everything. So, um, so that's confidentiality. This makes sure the data is only viewable by authorized users. Um, so there are ways to do this. The most common thing is you have authentication and access control. Before anybody comes in, they have to prove who they are with something like a username and password. And then the computer has a system that says only let people with this username go to this folder. People with, would have to have a different username to get in this other folder. Those two things put together are what you generally have. And um, a typical vulnerability that happens at colleges um, a lot, and pro it sounds like to me like the one that this guy found recently he's been in trouble for, is you have authentication, but you don't really have access control. So once you have logged in as one student, you can go over and view another student's records without having to authenticate as that student. So this is a fairly common flaw in security systems. There's just a door on the outside, and once you're on the inside, there are no further doors to restrict what you do. Um, all right, another thing is cryptography. Cryptography is generally stronger. Cryptography means your information is scrambled on the server, so if anybody sees it, they can't read it, and hopefully you have the only copy of the key. Then nobody can read it without that magic key that you have. But as we will talk a lot more, the problem here is how do you handle those keys? You have to somehow create them, you have to somehow save them, how do you get them back if you lose them, and is there some way to steal the key? And it turns out there often is, just like physical security. Even if you couldn't pick locks, 
you still have to have a key and you have to give all the authorized people keys and how do you really make sure that nobody's making extra copies of the key or somehow stealing keys from authorized users, it's a problem. Integrity, make sure nobody has been altering stuff that shouldn't be. Um, so if you want to make sure that something has not been altered, you need an easy way to detect the original from an altered condition and that's what hash values are. Generally, you can use hash, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2, or HMAC. These are just different ways of taking an arbitrary large file, or even a group of files, and boiling it down to one number. So I say, this number is the same, nobody's been altering it. If anybody altered anything, this number would change, and then I could detect that. And you can get a product like Tripwire that will live on your server, and it will check all the important files, and if anybody alters a file, it will do something about it. Like immediately alert the administrator. Wait, somebody's been altering a file, here's the file they altered. Either you just got infected, or some administrator is doing something strange, and you should probably look into this. Um, and then, so when you download things, for example, if you download Backtrack, which we'll use later, you get this download, and then it gives you an MD5 sum right there. And so you see, when you download it, calculate the MD5 of the file you got, and if it matches that, then you have some degree of confidence that the file has not been altered. Now, we'll talk about this more later, but MD5 is actually not very strong confidence. It is now possible to take a download, add a virus to it, add something to it that cancels out the effect of the virus to make the MD5 come out the same. That's not supposed to be possible, but MD5 is a weak hash function. It has collisions, so you should be using SHA-1 instead. But anyway, MD5 is a lot better than no hash at all. It's not perfect. But then nothing in security is ever perfect. Another thing you have to get used to. A lot of people think, I have the security measure, and as soon as one hacker says I found a problem, they say, well, you're an idiot, you shouldn't be using it. Well, it's not that way. Life is tough. I mean, you have some security measure, and it stops some of the attackers. Um, you can never stop them all, so, you, it's not bad to have weak security as long as you understand how strong it is, and then you can make a decision whether it's worth paying for better security or whether the weak security is good enough. And then availability. Availability means that authorized users can access the stuff to do their job. Um, if you, that's been the problem at City College lately, right? We've had DNS problems, so a bunch of people keep on not being able to access the servers, can't do their online classes, can't get to the CCS.edu. It's an availability problem. If, you're, if you like your power grid goes down and your servers go down, that's also an availability problem. And that is a security problem. Some people will forget this and say the things like um, fire extinguishers and locks on the door are not security measures, but they are. Fire extinguishers mean the building doesn't burn down, so it's available for people to get work. That's, uh, that's security. Yeah. That's why um, inside went down because of due to like, hacking and some of the sure network. As far as I know, no. I think it's, no, I think it's, as far as I know, the reason we went down was some kind of mistake in a firewall. Um, but what happened is the, the main DNS server didn't communicate with the secondary DNS servers correctly, so we had inconsistent DNS entries. I have not heard anything from the official people. I just, uh, other people on the outside have figured this out. And hopefully, we'll eventually find out what happened here, but that's one thing missing at this college is a good system whereby we have statements after an outage of what caused the outage. So here's things that make availability higher. Disk redundancies. Your hard disks fail every now and then. Every hard disk is only good for so many thousand hours before it breaks. So if you only have one hard disk, when the hard disk breaks, the computer goes down. So you make a RAID, you know, a group of disks all working together so that even when one disk fails, you still have the data on the other disks. Uh, multiple servers, you can have multiple sites. That's um, the only company I've ever heard of that actually achieved five nines, which is 99.999% up was Hartford Insurance in Texas. The guy was really serious about it, and he set up six times overage. He built the servers that could handle six times what they needed to handle, and he split them into three towns separated by 300 miles, so even when a hurricane came through and wiped out a whole town, his server stayed up, because there was another server geolocated elsewhere that could take it over. That's called site redundancy. You have multiple sites all working together, and uh, that's what you need if you're really serious about staying up. Now, a site like City College, I mean, if a hurricane wipes out the college, who cares about the servers? You can't teach the classes, you know, there's no point having another server somewhere else. Um, so it would be totally useless to do it at a college. But if you're Google or Amazon, your whole business is selling stuff online, your site has to stay up, even if there's a war and the whole country vanishes from the internet, you want the rest of them to keep being able to buy books. So they're geolocated all over the world. Um, all right, then backups are important here. Backups do not keep your site up all the time, but they make it so you can recover more quickly when something goes wrong. If you only have one server like City College and it totally crashes, the building burns down, then hopefully you have a backup tape someplace. You can just go get another server, restore from backup, and be back in a few hours. 
instead of maybe a week, which is maybe how long it would take you to rebuild all that stuff from the scratch. Um, and you know, ultimate power and cooling lets you survive problems with, it, with heat and cold and weather and power failures and rolling blackouts and all that nonsense that happens. So uh, you have to balance these three things. If you want more confidentiality, you're going to lose availability. That is the most common direction that people think about. Like when people say, I want more security, they say, well, I'll make everybody have to have a 25 character password and change it every month. And usually what this means is an enormous number of new users are going to forget their password and be locked out of their own account. So you now lowered availability. People can't get in. And you know, if that was happening in here, the students that came to add would not be able to get on the machines for a week until they created an account for them and all that jazz. So, you know, you lower availability by making it harder to get in for your authorized users. That's what you usually do. Stupid security measures irritate the authorized users and don't keep out the bad guys, like web. You can put web encryption on your router, which has the effect of irritating your authorized users so they have to type in that password to connect, but it doesn't stop bad guys because you can blow right through it. So this is anti-security. Stupid measures often have this effect of irritating your users and not stopping the bad guys. So you, the better thing is to have real security. That you're trying to minimize the annoyance of the legitimate users and make it more difficult for the bad guys. So you have to understand who the bad guys are and how they're coming in and, and design your security carefully. Microsoft did this with user account control. And Vista user account control would pop up every time you did anything until it drove you nuts, irritating the authorized users. In Windows 7, it only comes on when suspicious activities happen, which is less protection, but it doesn't irritate the legitimate users as much, so it's the right balance for most people. Here's something you might like, non-repudiation. Once somebody does something, they can't deny it later. This is really important if you want to loan somebody money. I'm going to give you some money, and you're going to give me a thousand bucks a month, and if you don't, I'm going to take your house. But then if you can come back later and say, oh no, I never signed that, that's not going to work. So benign repudiation is an important thing to have, and there are ways to do this. Digital signatures do it. Audit logs do it. Digital signatures are what you use if you sign a contract. Audit logs are what you use to check what your people are doing to find out what they've been doing. Whether you, for example, an administrator might do something bad at your company, like download a bunch of copyrighted stuff on your company network, and then try to lie about it later. And the logs will be something you can use to deny them the ability to, to, to repudiate that. Defense in depth is another fundamental principle. Uh, they, they call it the M&M um, security. It's the old-fashioned security. You have one firewall on the outside of the network and no other security. So once they get past that, they can just run rampant and do anything they want on the network. Uh, what's much better is to have defense in depth, where there are a series of defense measures. So if you get past the firewall, there's a server, but it's got a password. When you get a password on that server and try to go to the next server, there's something else in your way. And then there's another firewall, then there's an armed guard. You know, there's stuff in your way as you try to go in. So even if you do intrude, you can't do as much damage as fast because you hit layers of defense. It's much safer that way. So um, firewalls, you know, for example, in this college, in this lab, we got firewalls on the company network. We've got a firewall on the um, individual <coughs> workstation. We've got antivirus on the workstation. And we have deep freeze on the workstation. So if you try to take over one of these machines from the outside of campus, you got a lot of layers to defense, but if you walk into the room, you made it past the campus firewall, like if one of you try to install something rotten on these machines, you're still going to have a problem because the antivirus will stop you. But even if you do, all we have to do is restart the machine and deep freeze will put it back to normal. So there are layers of defense. So that's why we can have a lab here and we can have just a bunch of students do pretty much anything on these machines for whole semesters at a time without a real problem because our multiple layers of defense will catch all the bad things they do. In another lab, I didn't have deep freeze and some students put on BitTorrent started downloading copies of Harry Potter movies. We got a takedown notice from DMCA, which is what you get. So I demoted students from the administrators in that lab. And that fixed that problem. Anyway, um, implicit deny is another fundamental security issue. Um, there is always things you did not think of. And so then you have to decide what do you do with the exceptional cases. You can either allow anything that isn't for, explicitly forbidden, or you can deny anything that's not explicitly allowed, and the second is usually much more secure. So implicit deny is where you have some list. This is what Microsoft Windows uses for the file and folder permissions. Here's the permissions of this property. Authenticated users can do these things like modify and read these files. System can do certain things. Administrators and users can do things. But if you're not one of those, you can't do anything. If somebody comes in and they're not one of the approved entities, they'll have no access to that folder. That's how Windows works. This is how things usually work. But, um, for example, 
exit doors that have the bar on them. Most exit doors at buildings will let you out no matter who you are. You don't need a key, you don't need a group, because they're afraid the building might be on fire and you just want to escape. They won't let you in, but they'll let you out. Um, so that's not implicit denial. So here's some risk concepts. A risk is the likelihood of something bad happening and resulting in a loss. So a risk, risk analysis is getting this down to a number. How many dollars per year are we going to lose from this problem? That's risk. A threat is just a scary thing. This is a fundamental problem with our society. The, um, you know, Osama bin Laden wrote some very literate, very carefully thought out statements about why he was doing what he did. He said, you Americans are a bunch of childish cowards and all I have to do is poke you and you will run around like idiots being scared and filling your place with cops and lowering your civil rights and everything else because you're so afraid of me. And he's entirely right. It is a national character problem here. I wish we were like Winston Churchill and we would just show a stiff upper lip. It would be a far more effective response to terrorism to just not let it scare us. But we don't have that tradition. The British do and we don't for some reason. So um, our, our news is all full of threats. The lettuce is poisoned. Your, your air is argon in your air. There's kids getting kidnapped everywhere and they're on the milk cartons. There's all these things that might happen. And those are threats. But if you let your life be controlled by threats, you'll be one of these people hiding in your room under the bed. I mean, there are always scary things that might happen. You have to, the point of a professional security expert is you figure out what threats really matter. Yes, there are a million bad things that could happen, but which ones do we actually need to worry about? That's why you need risk analysis. So threats are just scary things that might happen. Anyway, usually talk about external threats, but I talked already, another big thing is insider threats. Your own employees may do ill-intentioned or evil things. They may be bribed, they may be disloyal, you know, they may just be confused. So worry about the people actually already have the privileges to be on your network may do bad things. You have to worry about that. A vulnerability is some kind of weakness that permits somebody to do something that they shouldn't be doing. So risk mitigation is an attempt to lower risks. Um, you, do, you do this by adding a control of some kind. So if you're worried about students installing viruses on the machines, you could do various controls. The simplest control would be risk avoidance. Get rid of the machines. No more open labs. There. Now I solved that problem. And you have solved that problem. You have also lowered some availability, so maybe that's the right answer, maybe that's not the right answer. Um, but it's one, one possible control is risk avoidance, where you eliminate the whole possibility. Another one is to put on antivirus and deep freeze and stuff, and then we limit the, the risk <coughs> which you make a decision. By the way, there are risks you cannot eliminate. Practically, you just accept them. That's another control. We say, yes, we accept that. Like I say, you can walk into class with a gun. There's no guard. There's no metal detector. We accept that risk at this college because it's not something that's worth worrying about. Um, if, if we had a lot of that, we would have to have all that nonsense with searching people, like the ex, like the UN airplanes or something. But it's more efficient to just accept that risk at the moment because San Francisco in this neighborhood is not that terrible. Things aren't. People aren't just shooting each other right and left all the time. I taught at a college where they had a bullet in the front of the room and students put their guns in when they came to class in the other classes. They didn't, as far as I know, they didn't have guns in my class. The issue didn't come up. But anyway, that was not in this neighborhood. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, could you explain more about what Deep Freeze does? Yeah. Oh, Deep Freeze just um, records everything you do that changes the machine, and when you restart, it rolls it all back. So if you restart the machine, it goes right back to its original condition. All the installed programs, malware changes, all your documents you put in my documents and everything, just vanish. Yeah. System restore, like an alter to the system. Well. System restore is a less complete version of the same thing. System restore just does it for operating system files. <coughs> yeah. Deep freeze is like a super system restore that rolls your whole machine back every time you restart it. It's like system image restore. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an image restore. Exactly. But it doesn't actually work that way. It actually works by measuring everything you do and then undoing it to make it faster. It used to be, um, an earlier version of it was called uh, Norton Goback. Roxy or Goback, something like that. Go back. Yeah. Or Norton Ghost. That's the Norton image. Ghost it's is the another image. version. Norton Ghost is a way of capturing deploying images, which amounts to the same thing. Yeah. All right. So you have the controls. You also have insurance, evacuation plans, insurance. It may not prevent a problem, but it will limit the financial damage because you pay a regular amount every year instead of having one huge <coughs> cost when something bad happens. And evacuation plans lower the damage done to you if you have a fire or something. So those are controls. Access controls limit who is allowed to access certain resources. Um, business continuity disaster plans mean you have a plan in place and you're prepared for disasters like floods and fires and tornadoes and such. Um, if you don't have a plan, then people will just run around like crazy when this happens. If you have a plan, then hopefully you've got you know fire extinguishers and 
special vehicles waiting to drive people out of the danger zone and somebody ready to go through the buildings to make sure there isn't somebody left behind and all that jazz. Antivirus software, of course, reduces the damage. It doesn't if you get viruses. So 